out first, having gone to hell? Our guest today has considered this question, but not from a philosophical viewpoint, instead from an archaeological one. He has gone to hell and back and has returned like the great heroes of the past with a high and wonderful story to tell. Robert Temple is the author of 10 books, which have been translated into 43 languages. He is best known for his classic and still controversial book, The Serious Mystery, which presents the idea that the Dagon people of Mali preserve the tradition of extraterrestrial contact with intelligent beings from the Sirius star system. Other books by Mr. Temple include The Genius of China and The Crystal Sun. He is visiting professor of the history and philosophy of science at Tsinghua University in Beijing, fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, member of the Egypt Exploration Society, Royal Historical Society, Institute of Classical Studies, and the Society for the Promotion of Hellenistic Studies and visiting research fellow of the University of the Aegean in Greece. His latest book, Oracles of the Dead, examines ancient methods of foretelling the future and discovering the physical location of the Greek underworld and explores the mysteries associated with Delphi and other oracles of the ancient world. Are there places where initiates came to be introduced to the secrets of the world of the gods? Do these places contain portals or doorways to the unknown country? Classical writers certainly thought so. Let's see what Robert Temple has dug up about what some consider to be the most incredible place on the earth. Welcome to Dreamland, Robert. Well, hello, William. It's nice to be talking to you. And I think I came all the way back from hell just for this experience. (laughs) <laughs> well, we certainly appreciate it's really time to be with us. If it's okay with you, uh, since most of our listeners are probably a little more familiar with your work on the serious mystery, I'd like to begin by catching up our audience on what has been going on perhaps these past 30 years since you published the serious mysteries in 1976. I've had just enough time to get the serious and back. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, it it seems like the the mid-70s, when you published The Serious Mystery, which you probably find it hard to believe it's been all those 30 years since then, but that time was when, of course, Sitchin published The Twelfth Planet, Eric Von Donneken's Chariots of the Gods was in the rage at that time, and in fact, I just read today that Von Donneken has a six-hour series on The Chariots of the Gods set to broadcast on uh, the Sci-Fi Channel. There seems as if, with the publication of your book, that you introduced a very powerful idea and powerful energy that still resonates. How do you feel about that line of research all these years later? Well, I'm glad it led to something. After all, it took me a long time to work all that out and write it up. And so uh, the fact that uh, some people read it and thought about it seriously was rewarding. One doesn't want to just write a book and throw it in the hole. Mm-hmm. Have your views changed on this, this subject in the intervening years? No, they haven't changed. Uh, they've grown. Mm-hmm. It, and speaking of growth, you know, there's some interesting new information that's coming out from an author named Laird Scranton, whose book will be published by Inner Traditions here soon. And taking... Uh, a leap from some of the original research that you've done. He believes that the Dagon system of tribal myths bears a striking resemblance to the actual scientific structure of matter, starting with the atom and continuing all the way down to vibrating threads of uh, string theory. Have you kept up with that line of research, or have you continued in that regard, looking at the Dagon words and symbols and rituals that were used to describe perhaps the structure of matter and how they correspond with those found in ancient Egypt? Well, um, there's an enormous amount of further information about the Dogon tribe that I couldn't squeeze into the serious mystery, and um, they're highly detailed uh, and numerically precise astrophysical knowledge is something that I reported, but I didn't go into all the other things, but they certainly did have uh, very advanced knowledge in other areas as well as that, and, and I think that people ought to be made aware that they have a, a writing system of over 30,000 written signs. 30,000 um, written signs? Yes. They have an unbelievably advanced culture in, in many ways, although they don't have what we would consider technology. Um, and so 
that, of course, was the basis of a serious mystery. How did they have detailed astrophysical knowledge, which could only be possessed if you had modern science with, without having modern science? And, and that's what led to the search as to where did the information come from and what was the answer to the mystery, which is still a mystery, but we think we know the answer. And so they they had advanced information about other things. There are indications that they knew about uh, genetics and uh, uh, all sorts of things. I haven't seen the book from Inner Traditions that you mentioned now by somebody called Scranton, who must be uh, a Pennsylvanian. But I uh, am, I do know Inner Traditions because they're my own publisher, and I highly of recommend them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Oracles of the Dead is the book. Inner Traditions is the publisher. Get your checkbook out. <laughs> That's great. You know, we are continually amazed by the the intense interest in this subject of extraterrestrial contact. You've got you talk about turning on the television these days that's all you see it seems and in the popular cultures tv shows such as stargate of course now they're even talking about re- reviving star trek uh, off the top of your head to kind of put you on the spot here just a moment robert if you were writing say a a fictional series that really told the story of the dagon and their interaction with these intelligent beings from sirius what would that show be like? How would you envision perhaps a first episode unfolding? How did this contact initiate, and what was it all about? The, the Dogon never claimed that they had contact with visitors from outer space. It's a mistake when people think that I wrote a book about spacemen visiting Africa, because that's not what the serious mystery is about at all. The Dogon preserved information, which they claim came from a, a much earlier extraterrestrial contact, which they admit to have taken place in a different location, certainly not in Mali, where the Dogon now live. And the search involved finding out where did this really happen and and who were the people who were around at the time and when was it. But I never suggested anything about uh, extraterrestrial visits to Mali. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying that. That that helps a lot because I think that is a a, a big misconception or a, certainly a popular one um, for those that haven't delved as, as deeply in the book as perhaps they should. Uh, let's, well, uh, I, I I would like very much to do something about getting the story across in, in a way such as you suggested, but it have to be done right, and um, that means that you have to know what was really going on, and since. The Serious Mystery came out in 1976 originally. I did a revised version of that book from in, that was published in 1998, which contained 50% more material. That's the one that's in print now, mm-hmm. which wholly supersedes the earlier edition, obviously. But even that is, is only a, a partial addition to the story, because as you pointed out, it's 30 years ago that the book came out, and that's 30 years of thinking time that I've had and further research. So the story's much bigger than anybody realizes, and I'd have to write an awful lot more than just a revised edition of the serious mystery to really get it across. But it is yeah, it maybe the biggest of stories. That is a, a refrain that we often hear from authors in this genre, especially those, well, for example, I had a conversation with Christopher Dunn, who wrote a book called The Giza Power Plant recently, and he, he's writing a new book right now, and he's confronted with that same issue that really the story is so much larger than a person can, can really wrap their imagination around, and it, it's, it's almost an impossible task to try and get it onto the printed page to communicate the story. What do you suppose uh, we may be missing? What what background knowledge do we knew do we need to bring into the fold here that's going to be able to help us to grasp this immense story? Well, one of the problems, William, is that uh, everybody's getting stupider every day. Education <laughs> has basically collapsed, and so we used to have um, a general reading public with uh, an ability to understand things. That, that was higher than it is today. And um, uh, a lot of younger people have very short attention spans, and they, they can't 
really take anything in if it's more than five minutes long or more than five pages long. And we, we have a dilemma that as the urgency to understand the purpose and nature of, of life on this planet gets greater, our ability to comprehend it gets less. This is due to a very serious decline in the level of our Western civilization. It's, it's in an advanced stage of decadence, which is accelerating. In fact, it's becoming exponential. And at the very moment when we need to have our wits about us, we're losing our wits. Is this a cyclical losing of our wits? In other words, do you feel like previous cultures had this understanding, there was this point of illumination, and then the darkness inevitably came, and now we're either going, coming into a, a place where we're going to go deeper into the darkness or we're going to emerge into the light. So is, is this a cyclical thing? Is it possible for us to grasp this, or do you think that basically uh, that, that we're pretty doomed at this moment? Well, I don't think we have a second chance now. Um, of course, there, there is a cyclical aspect to the rises and, and, and the falls of successive civilizations. And there are many factors in common uh, about the way different civilizations decline and collapse and are then finally replaced by somebody else. But that was then, and this is now. And what's happening now is different, because we now have major damage to the Earth's environment, and the climate change is so severe that um, we are basically accelerating towards the final showdown of are we going to make it or are we not going to make it? I don't think that there's another one after this. This is this is the one, the one that everybody's been waiting for for 10,000 years. You know, I, I used to really ridicule the kind of people who said the end of the world is nigh and the, the guys who used to stand on the street holding signs and, and saying uh, this was going to happen and, and all the silly cults who said the end of the world will be in 1999 and, or 1966 or, or yesterday or tomorrow or whatever. And, of course, they're all crazy. But I really do believe that this time it's for real that if we don't pull ourselves together, if we don't get to grips with the situation, which is fast approaching what they now call a tipping point, that's it. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. It's William Henry. We're continuing with Mr. Robert Temple. Robert, just before the break, we were talking about this idea of the tipping point, that now we're at the point of no return. This will, I think, enable us to segue into our conversation that we've invited you to discuss today, the, and foremost, and that is ancient techniques for predicting the future. We want to talk now about divination and prophecy. And to get into this, Robert, let me ask you this. What is it about divination and prophecy that fascinated you so much to put together this amazing 450-page work on this subject? Well, I, I've always been interested in the nature of time because I'm interested in the nature of reality, and reality has a certain temporal element to it. And, and in fact, um, I once published uh, my own theory of time, but it only appeared in German and never in English. The only person I ever knew who, who actually read it was Karl Popper, the philosopher, and he liked it, so that was my reward. But... I, I think that um, the, the particular interest in divination is, is it possible to know the future in advance? Because if so, it means our conventional notions of time are wrong. Now, the answer to that is simple for me because I've had prophetic dreams and um, prophetic hunches, which have been borne out. Therefore, I know subjectively that it's possible to know the future in advance, but uh, having the subjective certainty is one thing, convincing anybody else is another. And so, because I have a particular interest in the ancient world and, and the origins of civilizations, I've always been attracted to ancient Greece and Egypt and so forth. I decided to do a comprehensive survey of the techniques used to try to foretell the future throughout the ancient world. But because I'm not ethnocentric and because I've spent 20 years intimately connected with China, 
spent a vast amount of time out there. I decided that the book should have its first half about the ancient Western world and the second half about ancient China. So I divided the book in half. And the first half begins with this rather sensational discovery, which uh, my friend Michael Bajent has just recapitulated in his new book, The Jesus Papers, because he came with me on this trip at my invitation. It's a riveting account, by the way. Well, thank you, you almost Lee. have to put the book down. When Michael Bajent goes in and starts talking about your journey into these tunnels, which I hope you'll explore with us, is it's absolutely riveting. So. Well, uh, it took me 20 years to get permission to get into this place that was all sealed off. It was meant to be full of poison gas and snakes and, and whatever. Um, but before I say that, I should explain what it is. It's, it's the site of the ancient Oracle of the Dead, which was underground. And it's described in the Odyssey and at, at considerable length in the Aeneid. And it, it was mentioned by... Strabo, the ancient geographer, as being in the Greek portion of Italy, this is long before the Romans existed um, as a major force, and certainly before they set foot in the south of Italy, um, near modern Naples, northwest of Naples, at a place called Baia, which is named after Bios, one of the companions of Odysseus. And very near to Kuma, which had a famous Sibyl. And of course, I went there and explored the Sibyl's grotto. In the Aeneid, the Sibyl from Kuma, which is the earliest Greek settlement in Italy, takes Aeneas round the point in, in her boat into the harbor of Baia, which was overhung by huge, gloomy, ancient trees in those days. And there, were, there was a lot of volcanic uh, smoke hanging around and the smell of sulfur because it's near Vesuvius, you see. And <clears throat> she took him there because he wanted to consult the spirits of the dead. He wanted to speak to his father who had died. And he was taken to this unique establishment which was a replica of the underworld which the Greeks called Hades. And it was cut out of the solid rock deep underground and it goes for about a quarter of a mile or, or more we, we, because we don't know how far as there are other portions that are blocked up and, and I would love to clear it and excavate it but uh, I have to raise the funds to do that <laughs> however I also filmed it because I made a I presented and produced a, a documentary for the National Geographic Channel about this which I think has been shown in America, it's certainly been shown in, on the European National Geographic Channel many times, mm-hmm. called Descent into Hell. And so it, it consists of tunnels carved out of the solid rock, as I say, which are very narrow. And I did a computation of how many man-hours of work would have been acquired. Well, it would have taken um, more than two or three generations. And um, really, it's the most fantastic engineering feat but the most extraordinary thing is that it, it contains an artificial underground river, which was uh, 150 feet long, which they called the River Styx because it was meant to be the famous River Styx of hell. And they built they built one. It, it was like a kind of um, psychic, psychic Disneyland underground. And... You went down into this place in a very drugged state because you had to go through several days of preparation and drink various brews, and you were highly suggestible by the time you got there. And they took you down these tunnels with um, people wearing pointy hats like the Ku Klux Klan, and the Sybil in her scarlet robe would be leading the way, and there would be howling hounds down there because there were hounds of hell, and you would hear those. And you were taken down this by lamplight. There's over 500 lamp niches in the tunnel walls. And when we filmed it, my wife went down and spent an hour and a half just lighting candles. And we filmed in the tunnels entirely by candlelight, which was so eerie, really. Well, you went down this about 800 feet, and then you got 
on in a, onto a boat, a little coracle, and you were rowed along this underground river, and, and then it opened up into a lake, and then it narrowed down to a river again, and you went along that for a while, and you came to the landing stage at the far end, and you disembarked, and you then went up some stone steps, and you were led along until you came to the inner sanctum, where a seance was staged for your benefit, and you would hear voices and, and see strange sights, uh, a lot of which was special effects. And you would believe that you were consulting the spirits of the dead, and I believe that they had people who actually went into trance and who were mediums. And from time to time, you might even really speak to a spirit, who knows? But you certainly thought you did. If you were skeptical and thought the whole thing was a lot of bunk, you would never make it out alive because they'd kill you. They didn't want bad press. <laughs> and this was the Oracle of the Dead. So it's all there. And it took me 20 years to get the permission to go inside because the Italians in South of Italy are deeply religious people who are not into hell and Satan. Not that there's any connection with Satan, of course, but mm -hmm. you never know. Uh, especially if you're South Italian Catholic, what might be going on underground, better not to know. So it was very difficult getting the access. And, and when I went, I thought I'd get my friend Michael to come with me because he had spent so many years crawling around caves at Qumran looking for Dead Sea Scrolls. And he really is an expert at tunnels. And um, we went in together with, with my wife and... Uh, found the place uh, most fascinating, and it had been blocked up by the ancient Romans who were in fear and dread of it when they finally conquered that region of Italy, and, and I, I worked out that it would have taken 30,000 man-hours just to carry the soil and rubble in to block a lot of it up. Wow. Now, w we couldn't get into all of it because some of the passages were completely sealed, but and the inner sanctum is, is completely full of soil and rubble put there by the Romans, and the doors bricked up. And there are other doors cemented over. It's, it's quite a job of trying to render it inoperable to destroy it forever, which we believe was done by the son-in-law of the Emperor Augustus, a man whose name was Agrippa. He also cut down all the trees in the area to make Roman ships. That was the end of the spooky surrounding of the one. Right, you mentioned in the book that those were, were they oak trees, Robert? And I thought you mentioned that they caused yes. uh, shivers up a spine when you walked into this forest? Yes, mm -hmm. they're what's known as home oaks. Home spelled H-O-L-M. Home mm -hmm. oaks are evergreen. They don't lose their leaves in the winter. They're wonderful trees. And th these were the primeval trees of the Mediterranean area, area in ancient times. And they were all cut down to make ships um, over many centuries, and there are hardly any left now. And the secondary growth that came up under them is known as Kermes oaks, and that forms a kind of scrub or a maki, so that um, the the whole area is, is now just scrubland, if there's anything at all. Because what really destroyed ancient Greece was the bloody goats. They've got all these goats, and goats will eat anything and everything. So that's why it's all bare in Greece now. But in ancient times, everything in Greece was covered in vast forests. And all those Greek islands, which are now treeless, were covered in trees. Only a few, how many trees left now? But the, these gigantic home oaks, which would have been probably a couple of hundred feet high and, and you know, hundreds of years old, were hanging down over the water and... It was really wild, and, and it's still very wild. For instance, you still can't walk between Kuma and Baia because of the impenetrable scrub. And in those days, it would have been impenetrable forest full of dangerous wild beasts, and you'd get lost. It, it, and we'll it's continue still, with Robert uh, Temple about this incredibly magical place after this break. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're continuing with Robert Temple. Robert, just before the break, we were talking about what an astoundingly just magical and mysterious place this must have been with these immense oak trees and perhaps energy that was present in the place. 
One of the things I wanted to ask you about, though, are the, the oracles of the Sibyl. Other commentators have talked about the role the Sibylline prophecies play in Christian prophecy and indeed in Roman religion. And I'm intrigued by Michelangelo's painting of the Sibylline oracle on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. He shows two genies or genii looking down upon open pages of the book held by one of the Sibyls. And in the book, uh, the Oracle of De- Oracles of the Dead, you talk about an experience that you had at the place where the Sibyl sat at Kuma when two faces appeared. Could you tell us about this? Yes, well, the, the Sibyl of Kuma um, had open uh, consultations. She uh, she gave, delivered her prophecies while in a state of trance in a cavern cut into the side of a hill at Kuma, and you could stand and look in from the outside through openings that were cut for the public, although the, the person actually was actually coming for the consultation went down a very weird corridor along while very. sat on stone benches and 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 in the the film that I made, I, I go through step by step exactly what happened where and so forth. But yes, I had this strange psychic experience when I was there where I saw a young Sybil and an older woman. And the um, the young Sybil had um, one brown eye and one blue eye. And um, she was very remarkable. Um, it, I don't often have anything remotely approaching a visual hallucination. I'm not given to them. But I certainly, on this occasion, had an overwhelming one that I saw this older woman, who was not a very nice person, teaching this innocent young girl how to be the Sybil. And I had a distinct feeling that this was the last Sybil. Hmm. Now, you mentioned the biblical prophecy or the prophecy of the birth of Jesus, it's a very strange tale. The the last Sibyl seems to have um, delivered a prophecy, uh, which was um, also repeated by Virgil in one of his poems, about um, the birth of Jesus. And, and this was very popular with the early Christians, and was prominently prominently mentioned by Augustine in his City of God, his book called The City of God. The the early Christians were very keen on this, and it made a convenient bridge between Roman paganism and Roman Christianity, because it was very handy to have uh, a Roman-sponsored pagan, even though she was Far from being Roman, she would have been Greek because everybody was Greek down there at Kuma, um, making this convenient prophecy, which may well be genuine. Yeah, and it makes you wonder, well, this seems to be a whole kind of missing piece to the, the whole Christian story when you're uncovering the very place of origin of this prophecy. And I find it so uh, fascinating that Michael Bachin is your quote-unquote partner in this research endeavor What with the incredible impact that he's having on the, the global attempt to understand the true origins and mysteries of Christianity. I, I, do you feel any way like you're being sort of uh, destined in a way to bring this information forward, to look up with Michael Bachin at this time, to, to bring this revelation to the public? Well, I think that people like myself and Michael are, are basically um, laborers in the vineyard, that um, we have jobs, which is to try to uh, explore the answers to some of the mysteries that that uh, beset civilization, and I certainly feel that I'm just doing a job all the time, uh, uncovering all these things. I don't feel personally involved. I, I feel rather detached. You know, um, I don't. It, none of it really surprises me, even though it surprises everybody else, because I just feel like I'm doing my job. My job is to basically solve ancient mysteries. You, just, you, you basically turn me on, and I solve ancient mysteries, and you press a button, and I go to sleep. As I understand it, you and you met Michael Bajan in Egypt while you were on a tour together. And I wonder, did you uh, visit the Queen's Chamber of the Great Pyramid? Have you ever been in the Queen's Chamber? Oh, yes. I've spent time alone inside the Great Pyramid, which is fascinating. I, I've spent a lot of time alone in the Queen's Chamber, and then I've inspected it uh, and the passage leading to it very closely. I'm, I'm very much involved in Egyptological 
research because I've um, I've worked at some sites with the permission of what they grandly call the Supreme Council of Antiquities mm-hmm. um, in connection with the, some archaeometric studies. So uh, although I'm not an archaeologist, I have worked with archaeologists, and I've been into many closed sites and um, uh, all of my work on ancient Egypt really is not published yet. Well, a bit of it, just a foretaste, appeared in my book, The Crystal Sun. Mm-hmm. Because, I, you know, I did make a very important discovery in in Egypt at Giza, which I reported in that book, which was actually on a different subject, but I published the photo and described this phenomenon. I discovered um, a, a winter solstice sunset phenomenon at Giza, which is the largest optical display ever mounted by anybody in the ancient world. I I managed to discover, and I don't know why nobody else did this in the three and a half thousand years that it was there once a year to see, that the Pyramid of Kephren, as it's called, at sunset on the winter solstice, casts a shadow on the south face of the Great Pyramid, which you can see if it's not too hazy, I was there one year, and you couldn't actually see any shadow at all because of the haze, but as long as you don't have too much smog, you can see it very clearly. And that shadow is at the precise angle of the passages on the inside of that pyramid. Interesting. And and it's certainly not by chance. And that particular angle is known as the golden angle, and it's defined by the golden section. And there is only one angle that has this quality, and that is the angle of the shadow, and it's the angle of both the ascending and descending passages inside that the same structure. So, it was a once-a-year indication on the outside of the pyramid of what was concealed on the inside. Sort of like a key to the, the mystery of the pyramid, in other words? Yes. The Egyptian priests are always pulling tricks like that, because if you're an Egyptian priest, and you know all of those this stuff, you you easily get bored and you want to tease people or you want to give a little hint here and a a little hint there. It's a bit like trying to figure out the secrets of alchemy. You know, the alchemists are always writing these books with a little hint here and a little hint there just to drive you crazy. And the Egyptian priests were not immune to that kind of thing. (laughs) After all, they, they were rather obsessed with what they were doing and Masters of the pond, too. Yes, but think about this, William. Imagine building a vast pyramid that's only a little bit smaller than the main one, very near to the main one, in precisely the right spot and of precisely the, the right dimensions to cast precisely the right shadow at precisely the right time. Right. That's kind of heavy, heavy duty stuff. Think about it. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, Robert, is um, have you considered the, the, the similarity between that, that strange trapezoidal corridor of the Sibyl's Grotto at Kuma and the, the trapezoidal shape inside the Queen's Chamber? Well, you know, William, I never thought of that. <clears throat> That's very interesting. What would, you, what would be your reaction to that? Why would both of those places have that similar odd shape and also apparently seeming to have some form of acoustical function, because as you noted, when the Sybil spoke her prophecies at Kuma, doors, a hundred doors flew open in the various openings, and her message could be heard by the crowd gathered outside. And I've experienced the same thing inside the Queen's Chamber with that trapezoidal inset or the niche in the wall there, and being able to hear voices in other parts of the pyramid. I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on that. Well, the ancients were certainly great sound engineers. There's no doubt about it, and the King's Chamber has these features. And what you're referring to is a, is a, an often neglected aspect of ancient sites, which has been coming more and more to the fore as people like yourself have been taking notice of it. And I found the same thing in the Oracle of the Dead. In the film that I made, I, I demonstrated the, the extraordinary, extraordinary resonating qualities of the tunnels and and I detected the fundamental note of that particular edifice. 
And in the serious mystery, I give a long description of the importance of the musical octave in antiquity and that the geodetic centers or many navels of the earth were laid out on the surface of the earth in an octave and Delphi is one of those prominent places. I'll, I'll give a very eerie example of what I'm talking about, which will interest also people who have an interest in the Bible. Everybody knows about Noah's flood and that his ark landed on Mount Ararat, which is way over on the border between Turkey and Armenia today. And that's a long, long way away from Greece. But the Greeks also had a flood in their mythology, and uh, their flood hero was called Deucalion, and he had an ark as well. And his ark also landed on the mountaintop. Now, there are two two variants according to uh, uh, um, which mountain you prefer. The, the Greeks said that it either landed on Mount Tamaros, which was at an oracle center called Dodona, which was very ancient which was an oracle of the oak trees, by the way, mm-hmm. or at Mount Parnassus at Delphi. Well, uh, long, long ago, when I was writing The Serious Mystery and I looked into all this, I discovered that that Mount Ararat and Mount Tamaros at Dodona were on the same line of latitude, and that what we had was uh, a story in the Bible talking about an ark after the flood landing on one mountain, and I think about two and a half thousand miles, we had the Greeks talking about their ark landing on another mountain, and those mountains are on the same latitude line. Mm-hmm. So we have clearly got a common origin to the flood stories. But that's not surprising, because we know the flood stories go back to Sumerian times, which was long before any Greeks existed, or even before the Babylonians existed. And this so, is William uh, Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're continuing with Mr. Robert Temple. Robert, just before the break, we were talking about the, the universal flood myth, the global flood myth, and you were talking about how the, the two sites lined up on the same latitude lines. And uh, Did you have additional comments in that regard? Well, just to emphasize that it was basically the culmination of an octave, a musical octave. Mm-hmm. And once again, this is a combination of the ancient knowledge of music and harmonic resonance and sound with ancient sites, which is what you were mentioning. And to return to the pyramid, yes, there are certainly harmonics going on there. And you were wondering about the trapezoidal shape. Well, I must confess that I'm still puzzled by the trapezoidal shape. The, the the shape which is found in the Kuma tunnel, it seems to be Etruscan. And I believe that the tunnel was made by Etruscan engineers who were captured by the tyrant of Kuma in battle. But where did the Etruscans get this shape from? And could there be any possible connection with the very bizarre shape of that inexplicable doorway in the Queen's Chamber of the Pyramid? That remains a mystery don't have an answer for you. Very interesting connections, though, aren't there? Uh, One of the the things that I'd like to talk with you about that I found most intriguing in your book is the subject of comets, and comets as being uh, portents of the future and the ancient beliefs concerning comets and diseases from space. Could could you comment on that for us for a moment, please? Well... Long ago, in a previous life, when I was co-editing a magazine called Second Look, um, I serialized two books by two friends of mine, Fred Hoyle and Chandra Vikramasinghe, who are astrophysicists, and Fred has since died, uh, <clears throat> called Life Cloud and, and, and its sequel, which dealt with the idea that uh, comets are dirty snowballs carrying germs. Now, that's no longer shocking, but it certainly was in 1979 when we serialized these books where all the people were screaming at Fred and Chandra and saying that it's crazy because anybody with a new idea is crazy, in case you haven't noticed. And they maintained that every time a comet came near the sun that a certain amount of its tail vaporized due to solar radiation and, and sprayed round the Earth and 
particles, which would include viruses, would filter down through the atmosphere and cause plagues because these viruses don't only mutate within the human body, they mutate while they're sitting around doing inside comets, which are going through space. And that this is a regular thing that's happened through history and is concerned with um, new types of flu and so forth. So that influenza viruses uh, aren't only changing because of ducks and bird flu and all that, and pigs, but because of comets. Well, this certainly goes along with the ancient idea that comets could sometimes be connected with plagues. That when there was a uh, comet appearing in the sky, six weeks later, everybody would stop, start dropping down dead of some new disease. Of course, they were sharp observers, and they were observing nature, whereas we're too busy watching television. The reason I'm asking, Robert, is because lately it seems like every time you, you turn on the news or you, you even our unknowncountry.com site, we're reporting on comets and comets that are breaking up and all this sort of thing. And In fact, next year the, the, the supernova 1987A is expected to become visible to the naked eye again. And some even say it's a, a new star of Bethlehem. And what I'm wondering is, in addition to comets, what are your thoughts on novas or other stellar events and their impact on on our consciousness? And are you looking for any particular events? Have you made any uh, connections between prophecy and any kind of stellar events that are on the horizon? Well, the first thing to remember when we discuss a subject like this is that every atom in you and every atom in me comes from a nova or supernova explosion. Mm-hmm. Because that's where everything other than hydrogen and helium really comes from. The the great star factories which blow up and blast uh, their guts all around the universe from which planets are then made. And, and out of planets you get us and others. And so we're basically made of stardust. That's what it's all about. Soil those covers this planet is stardust that's dropped down over the eons through the atmosphere. Not to mention, of course, eroded rock mixed with it and rotting vegetation. But basically, stardust is everywhere, and you and I are stardust. In fact, the whole planet Earth is stardust. So that is the fundamental importance of novas and supernovas that we need to start by recognizing. Now, if you're referring to them in terms of um, prognoses for the future or harbingers of events, um, I'm inclined to think that they are too far away to be relevant to our system because they're light years away. And although I'm a great believer in interconnectivity, I don't want to stretch it that far in terms of the simultaneous nature of it. I, I really wouldn't think that the appearances of novas or supernovas are anything to do with something like the Star of Bethlehem, for instance. Nor do I think that the Star of Bethlehem was a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, as has been suggested. It's very difficult to know, but there are completely different explanations for the Star of Bethlehem. Um, You know, religion in its institutionalized sense is full of all kinds of false information. Take, and I don't mean to get too far away from Renovas, the example of St. Paul, who had a conversion experience on the road to Damascus. Now, everybody assumes that that means Damascus and Syria, but it doesn't mean that at all. Because people don't know enough about these things, they don't realize that there was another place that was called Damascus, and it wasn't in Syria, it was in Judea. Much easier for Paul to reach. He was a Pharisee who was going out and persecuting the Essenes and various extreme Jewish sects. And one of the places where they lived was a little settlement called Damascus near the Dead Sea. He was on a road which we can conceive of as nothing much more than a donkey track, going off to persecute the Essenes at, the, at Damascus by the Red by the Dead Sea in Judea, and he had his religious experience. So then you consider the the town of Nazareth. It's completely false to think that 
Jesus came from a town called Nazareth because Nazareth didn't exist in his lifetime. He was known as Jesus the Nazarene, which is quite different because the word Nazarene means something absolutely different and has no connection with a town called Nazareth. And the glosses that were put over the the sacred text suggesting that Jesus was born and raised in Nazareth were misinterpretations due to the fact that people who did that no longer remembered or chose not to remember what it meant to say that Jesus was a Nazarene. The Nazarene was a particular group of people with a particular religious angle on things. But that was, that's a long discussion that we don't want to go into. But I'm just mentioning that some of the most obvious things that we think we can take for granted really are quite different. And when you come to the Star of Bethlehem, you come up against the same problem. Who were the Magi? And what were they going to Bethlehem for? And what is there about a star over a manger with a child in it? If you were to read Mystery of the Cathedrals by Falconelli, you would get the alchemical explanation that the star is a sign which appears in the alchemical process when the Holy Child is being born, which is a an allegory of an alchemical process. But that's one possibility. There are numerous ways of looking at all this, and things that can be symbolic don't necessarily have to be literal. This is where it becomes difficult if you are a fundamentalist. Fundamentalism is second-hand thinking. You have a brain implant. Somebody tells you how to think, you believe it. That's called faith. Faith means abdicating your right to think and you accept somebody else's ideas because it's really easy and makes you feel good. So then you have something called faith and you become a fundamentalist and and you don't really have a lot of effort involved because you've had a brain implant, you see, and you just believe what somebody else has worked out for you. And this is what all institutional religions are like. They want to basically give brain implants to all the followers so that the clergy or the preachers or the bishops and cardinals can run everything. And they can cream all the money and all the power off the structure while all the victims go around feeling good because they got something they call faith. And they don't believe in faith. I believe in using your own brain. And the brain is the least used organ of the human species. We use our livers and our stomachs and we use our kidneys. We use our eyes and our ears. We don't use our brains. And brains are falling into increasing disuse these days because of the lack of education, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Here's the reason why I wanted to ask you about the the supernovas and the star of Bethlehem. And 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 now that you brought the brain into it and alchemy, this really will help me to formulate this question. The oracles were places that were entry points to the underworld. They were meeting places with the gods. The gods are considered to have been stars. The gods were starry energy or the sacred energy the netters in ancient Egypt. What I'm wondering, Robert, today we build neutrino observatories deep, deep underground that have photo detectors, and we're trying to capture a cosmic ray. We're trying to capture a neutrino. Have you come across any references to the ancient initiates going deep into these oracles in order to connect with the gods in the literal sense in the form of cosmic rays or or energies coming from the stars that help them perform the biochemical transmutation within themselves from an in, from a mortal being into an immortal being even a light being yes um, initiation traditionally took place in underground locations and I believe that the Oracle of the Dead was an initiation center wasn't when it wasn't in use as a, an actual oracle center because um, there is an unpublished gold plate of the Pythagoreans, which I put Michael Bajan on to, that was translated by Professor Burkert, whom I met from Switzerland, uh, which referred to the initiation places underground in South Italy, and there is only one. That's the one that I was talking about earlier. And the, the the most famous underground initiation centers are the ones in Egypt. And I've been in some of them. Uh, well, I've been in several of them. The crypt under the temple and the, um, the subterranean chamber under the Great Pyramid is pretty uncanny, too. 
These are very strange places, and there's no doubt whatsoever that they were used for initiation, as were sealed chambers. And one of the most bizarre is is the famous crypt underneath the Temple of Dendera, Mm -hmm. which has the the strange carvings on the walls, which I'm sure you know about, because everybody, including Fandanikin and his brother, has talked about it and photographed it. Just the weird carvings that nobody can explain. And I've made a fair study of this. This is also one of Michael Beijing's great interests. It's something that we often discuss together. We're hoping to have him on Dreamland here soon, too, by the way. Yes, well, you'll have good value there because Michael can talk very well and you'll learn a lot. He's a great, great guy. We're very good pals. Uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You were making the point about the, the, the crypt at Dandera with the strange carvings of the Dejed pillars that some say are actually crooks tubes or might yes, even be well, cathode ray tubes. There's more. There's quite a lot more to all this than, than meets the eye. And, and I've made a number of discoveries about... Uh, I've made a number of discoveries about uh, some of the more mysterious constructions in Egypt, but... Unfortunately, I haven't published those yet, and I think that when people are able to read all that, they'll find even more to think about. But I'm very grateful, William, for your interest in in this book, Oracles of the Dead, that I've brought out. Uh, That's my latest one in the States, and um, it's a start, but one never finishes this journey to try to understand all these mysterious phenomena. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you've asked me onto your program and had this interesting conversation with me. Well, we're certainly very thankful and grateful to you, Robert, for taking the time to talk with us today. Uh, in the couple of minutes we have left, uh, we know you're working, uh, maybe getting this, the Egyptian material together. Are you working on other any other projects you'd like to tell us about? Well, I do many things. Um, my, I have business activities, and my my main one, which I've spent six years on, it may not be as glamorous as writing about ancient mysteries, but it's it's more important, actually, is that um, I own the worldwide rights on a new technology to replace the the worst um, source of greenhouse gases in the world, namely Portland cement, with a clean cement, which would reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 90%, emissions which constitute 17% of the greenhouse gases of the world, and it's wow. a proven technology. And so I'm looking well, forward to putting again, that into practice because it's it's a way of trying to reverse climate change. Absolutely. Job one, you're absolutely correct. Well, once again, Robert, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. I hope you'll come back and keep us informed on your future activities. And maybe, who knows, we'll have a conversation together with Michael Bajan one day. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. Next up, Linda Moulton Howe. You're about to experience something you just can't get elsewhere. Emmy Award-winning science reporter Linda Moulton Howe reporting on the absolute leading edge of science, discovery, and the true mysteries of the unknown. Don't miss her website, earthfiles.com. This week, she's reporting on more about that bizarre horse in the sky, some extraordinary UFO sightings of Saskatchewan, and a a breakthrough discovery about the Fatima appearance. What an incredible week it is. Here she is from Albuquerque, Linda Moulton Howe. That's right, Whitley. It's like the Earth mysteries keep bursting out like popcorn. You know, it was a week ago on June 22nd that I reported about an alleged alive horse suspended high in the air beyond towers and antenna in front of an apartment building in Milan, Italy. Three minutes of that horse in the air were videotaped, and a copy of that tape was given to Jaime Masson, investigative reporter from Mexico City. Jaime called to discuss the tape because I've reported eyewitnesses who have seen animals rise and they say they look paralyzed, not moving, in beams of light from pastures where the animals are later found dead and mutilated. The perpetrators of animal mutilations have been described by the late U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Philip J. Corso as extraterrestrial biological entities, which use beam and laser technologies to interact with Earth life. After my report about the Milan flying horse, 
I received yet another image of a horse in the air beyond telephone wires. It was allegedly photographed by a Texas resident a year ago in June of 2005. That photograph is now at my news website, earthfiles.com. At the top of the headlines page is a hot link to my report, Another Horse in the Sky. Horses suspended in the air are not the only creatures reported by eyewitnesses to float or stand in the sky. Eighty-nine years ago, on May 13, 1917, three children watching sheep in Fatima, Portugal, saw lightning and then what they described as a, quote, small, pretty lady, unquote, appeared standing very still at the top of an oak tree. The lady told them that she would return to the same oak grove every month for six months. Her last visit would be October 13, 1917, and then she would tell the children who she was and what she wanted. The lady did appear on the 13th of each month after that. As word spread that a miracle was happening in Fatima, Portugal, an estimated crowd of 50,000 people were gathered on October 13, 1917, for the sixth and final appearance. By then, the Catholic Jesuits in the parish said it was the Virgin Mary, even though the apparition suspended at the top of the oak tree never called herself that. The oldest of the three children was Lucia. She reported to the parish priest after the last October apparition that she heard the lady say, quote, Build a chapel here to Our Lady of the Rosary, unquote. The Jesuit priests in the Fatima region then announced to the world that Christ's mother had appeared in Fatima to convert humans to, quote, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, unquote. But what exactly did those three children, Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco, say they saw at the top of an oak tree? I am now quoting from page 18 of a 2005 book, by Portugal historians entitled Heavenly Lights, The Apparitions of Fatima and the UFO Phenomenon. The authors are Dr. Joaquim Fernandez and Pina Darmada. Here is their list of the Fatima apparition description. She was an apparently feminine and very beautiful figure, wrapped in a light that blinded, was approximately three and one-half feet tall, appeared to be between 12 and 15 years old, wore a skirt, a coat, and maybe a cape, which were white. Her skirt and robe had a checkered pattern of gold thread. She wore something on her head that covered her ears and hair. She had black eyes. She had a strand of beads resembling a rosary, some type of hoop earrings at her neck and a luminous ball at her waist. She came from above and disappeared little by little back up into the sky. She made no facial movement. She did not move her legs. She spoke without moving her lips, and she moved only her hands a little bit once in a while. Furthermore, in the official interrogations of 1923 by the formal Catholic Fatima Parish Inquiry, Lucia did not say it was the Virgin Mary. Lucia told church investigators that when she asked the small, glowing lady suspended at the top of the oak where she was from, the treetop apparition, quote, pointed to the sky, saying she was from there, unquote. The historians were intrigued by the strong UFO phenomenon link to Fatima. In fact, the cover of their first book, Heavenly Light, The Apparitions of Fatima and the UFO Phenomenon, has a photograph of the three child eyewitnesses resting above a graphic image of three gray alien beings with large black slanted eyes. Now, in their second latest book, in a trilogy about the Fatima events of 1917, the historians from Portugal focus on a, quote, conspiracy to cover up the true origins of the Fatima prophecy. 
the two Portuguese authors formally asked Catholic Church authority for access to the original records of the Fatima incident, which had been held secretly by the church in archives located at the sanctuary of Fatima since 1917. Quoting from their own press release about this new book, quote, for the first time they tell the esoteric history of the cover story concocted by the church, which has both shaped our modern view of the Fatima incident and obscured its true significance as the first major UFO close encounter case of the 20th century. At the heart of the matter lies a conspiracy by the Jesuits to suppress the fact that the entities encountered by the children at Fatima were not deities descending from heaven, but rather were alien beings visiting our planet from elsewhere in the vast cosmos, unquote. Recently, I talked with the Portuguese authors of Heavenly Lights and this new second book, Celestial Secrets, The Hidden History of the Fatima Cover-Up, to be released in July 2006. The English translator in this interview is Alexandra Bruce. And my first question by phone to the authors, who you will not hear, you will only hear the English translation, was, what evidence convinced them as historians that Fatima was caused by the UFO phenomenon? Because of the direct testimony of many, many witnesses of disc-shaped craft which started out silver but became transparent and revealed the bodies of three beings inside. And there were strange angelic interfaces. There were apparitions floating above a particular oak tree in a field that I think Andy has interpreted to be some kind of a holographic projection from a UFO right. like hovering above. It seemed to be directly linked to a like a ray that mm -hmm. came from higher up that was being beamed from on high that went up to the clouds. When it shut off, it retracted back up into the clouds. It looked like a projected image. If there was technology and people saw disks and they saw beings in the disks and they saw beams that were projecting the entities that were translucent, did the Jesuit priests then force Lucia to lie. Okay. My answer would be yes. <laughs> First off, they want it to make it clear, and it's in the table of contents and it's the way the book is structured. There's Fatima 1 mm -hmm. and Fatima 2. Fatima 1 is what the kids and the witnesses mm -hmm. of the events of 1917 described. Fatima 2 is the version that goes down in history that was sort of cobbled together by the Jesuits. And what they're trying to explain is that the, the political background during that time, because prior to the establishment of the Republic of Portugal, the church and the state had been one. The Catholic Church's hierarchy were expelled from Portugal and fled to Galicia. That's where she was interned in a one of those nunneries, I'm forgetting the name, where you're not allowed to speak, mm -hmm. at the age of 18. There she was, someone who wasn't allowed to speak. And she was visited and basically told what to do by Jesuits on a regular basis. She was visited by Jesuit priests who had also been expelled from Spain. And they basically built their own version of the Fatima story. Between the two manuscripts, there are two very specific descriptions. One is of a blonde-haired, white-skinned, blue-eyed girl of approximately 14 who is described in one incident. Yeah. In another, it is described, I believe it's the being above the tree, as having black eyes. And that would seem to be like the greys. The blonde, blue-eyed would seem to be like the Nordics in the classic E.T. literature. Right, yeah, and yes, you're correct. The Maria, the Marian, whatever apparition above the oak tree did have black eyes, yes. Yeah and very small features. So how do these investigators reconcile two completely different extraterrestrial groups being involved in what may have been a highly deceptive series of events, specifically to co-opt the population into thinking it was a religious event? 
in their opinion, the extraterrestrial hypothesis or phenomenon is an interdimensional, ongoing, millennial, ancient thing that we superimpose our own meaning upon. And so the meanings that were ascribed to the events of Fatima came from the psychological and cultural language of the culture of those times. And then, yeah, then the, the Jesuits sort of manipulated it to fit their goals, which were to make Russia Christian again. This stuff has been going on forever. It's not going to stop, and it'll just morph. We'll give it new meanings as our own technology and culture and evolves. We'll start ascribing and having a different relationship to these sort of events. What is the implication for these investigators of what appears to be a deliberate effort on the part of the extraterrestrial intelligence to masquerade itself as Marian apparitions, which the Catholic Church had by then accepted? That's a really interesting question. Well, Kiala Papijina, the kids said, and everyone else said, if we saw a woman dressed in white or whatever, what, who else could it be? I think, and this was my question to them, do you really think that they were trying to look like Catholic imagery, or do you think that just the subconscious and the cultural milieu and, I mean, you know, you just try to make sense out of something that doesn't make sense, and so you make sense of it by applying the most, like, okay, it's, it's a saint, it's an angel, it's a, then I guess as the 50s start to happen and high tech starts happening and sci-fi starts happening, you start describing it as something else. Whatever it was, it was interdimensional, and it wasn't Mother Mary, it was something that I think that the kids, in order to make sense out of it, said it looked like a pretty woman, and then it sort of morphed over time as the Jesuits got their hands on it and as everyone else, because they were all was a super religious country. And so make it into a blessing and make it to a good, happy, wonderful thing instead of something scary and bizarre. I think it was just plainly extraterrestrials manipulating humans. They don't rule that out, but... It doesn't seem as likely as it's just something that's beyond our ken. They don't feel that they have enough evidence to definitively say that what you said. They say that interdimensional, extradimensional, and, you know, weird phenomena, holograms, especially when you're talking about 1917 and rural Portugal, are all things that were so beyond the ken of the people involved that it's very hard to say definitively what happened. You're talking about a lot of illiterate people who went to church every Sunday. But the whole point of heavenly lights are 200 and some pages of the details that the subtitle underscores right. a UFO phenomenon, which is E.T. Okay. And what you said is that we were the first to really point out the incredible similarity to UFO encounters that occurred in Fatima, but there's more to it than even that because... Um, they don't feel right as scientists and with the knowledge base and the evidence. They know the, the local mythology and the, the fairies and the, these kinds of things that had been reported for eons in the area. Yes, it may have been an encounter of extraterrestrial flesh and blood, nuts and bolts, etc., but maybe the second book focuses more. I think the first one was more of a shock, like, wow, what if Fatima was a UFO encounter? The second book is going more into... Well, what the hell is a UFO? What the hell does extraterrestrial really mean? More of like the Jesuit manipulation of the story. This new book, Celestial Secrets, The Hidden History of the Fatima Cover-Up, by Portuguese historians Joaquin Fernandes, who is a Ph.D., and his co-author, Fina da Mata, is available beginning this weekend of July 1st at Amazon.com, at my news website, earthfiles.com, I have a hot link to the new book's Amazon.com page in my Fatima report, and I recommend reading Celestial Secrets and that first book in this trilogy about the 1917 Fatima events entitled Heavenly Light, The Apparitions of Fatima and the UFO Phenomenon. And right now, modern-day UFO appearances of mysterious, unexplained, glowing discs are happening almost weekly at Meadow Lake and Waterhen Lake in Saskatchewan, Canada, northeast of Lloydminster. Barb Campbell is a manager at the Sandpiper Motel in Maidstone, Saskatchewan, 
which is about two hours or more from the lakes. She has been investigating unidentified aerial phenomena there that has been seen by eyewitnesses, many eyewitnesses. She also has investigated a recent cattle mutilation that she discovered on June 17th, only two weeks ago. I was raised around cattle most of my life. I've seen natural causes, like animals dying from natural causes. I've seen uh, what can happen when a bear attacks and also dogs and that. And the instant I came across this carcass in the field, I knew right away that this wasn't a predator kill. The one thing that really struck me was the position of her body. Very contorted, unnatural. It's not something the animal would have just suddenly dropped sick and died that way. Not possible. To me, it just seems like she was dropped. She was dropped from above and ended up in that position. Unfortunately, when we arrived at the scene, it had been at least a week and a half to two weeks since this occurred. It would have been nice to actually been there had it been fresh. But it's significant that there was that much preserved after two weeks in an, a land where natural predators such as coyotes normally would decimate carcasses. That's correct. Um, the one thing the farmer had noticed is that the coyotes won't come near it. And did you find any evidence of the animals struggling on the ground or any kind of tracks anywhere near or around the animal? Absolutely not. That's one of the things I really looked for because an animal that size is pretty strong. An animal like that would have put up such a struggle, too. Um, there would have been dirt like in our hooves and everything, too, deep marks, grooves in the ground, Nothing was disturbed. It's as if it happened somewhere else, and then the result is she got put on that spot, and that's it, left to rot. And like I said, too, if you look at the uh, incisions, they're cut straight. The edges are smooth. Some even look a little burnt. Now, did you talk with any of the neighbors to see if they had heard anything strange or seen anything strange in the air, on the ground, or any place around that pasture? Nobody's seen anything unusual. There's no other access to this place other than through, like, right past in front of the houses, which is really narrow. There's just road width to get through there or from the air. And if nobody come past their house, then whatever came there quite possibly came from above. And this was June 17, uh, 2006, that you received a call from the farmer about this mutilated cow and I'm wondering, how does this mutilation fit in to other unusual phenomena that you've been trying to study at Meadow Lake? Where is Meadow Lake in relationship to this pasture? It's probably a couple of hours going straight across. It's in line with a mutilation that occurred around the same time last year. The first one that was recorded last year was around Paradise Hill. That's not too far away from where this one was found this year. And then if you go further in the direction of Meadow Lake... There's been quite a few animal mutilations happening around Makwa in the past, and that's a direct line. There's a line going straight up to Meadow Lake, and if you look at a map. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's been a lot of strange lights, and then, of course, just a little bit northeast of Meadow Lake at Water Hen Lake, there was the massive amount of people, like over a 1,000 people, who've been uh, witness to some very unusual activity up there and close encounters. Can you describe the most dramatic? The most dramatic up there happened around 2.30 in the morning. Sightings began April 4th and were also recorded April 28th, three days prior to that. So possibly April 25th, 2.35 in the morning, the night watchman Kenny LaPratt was out watching doing his duty at uh, Water Hen Lake First Nation. And all of a sudden, like, he noticed these lights. Now, the people around here have always seen these lights. But for the first time, they started to come down. 10,000 feet, they came right down. Right over top of him, over onto the lake, a meter above the lake. Eight to nine objects, Kenny said. Size of houses. They're like two Frisbees on top of one another with an orange in the middle. The orange in the middle had windows all around it. They came down onto the lake. The lake has a thin layer of ice. And it went quite the distance across the lake. And then they started to alternate heights as if they're doing something, spinning. The top and the middle and the bottom are spinning separate directions from each other. The beautiful lights, bright orange on the top and underneath was like 15 different colors of the rainbow 
all in synchronization, like really smooth, like running into each other. So these objects are going up and down, and then two would take off, and another two would take their place, and this is going on for three and a half hours. So he's running around trying to wake everybody up that he can to come out and have a look at this. And he made a call also to the uh, RCMP, and an officer came out too and had a look, and he was baffled. Couldn't explain what that was. There's two officers who have seen these strange lights and objects at Water Hen Lake. And the story doesn't stop there, Whitley. Uh, I talked with Barb just a few days ago, and there are now some multiple eyewitnesses in firsthand face-to-face encounters with something that is described as being non-human, hominid, but more android than biological. And Barb is now trying to investigate the fact that there are multiple eyewitnesses to this, uh, will be quite interesting to see what more we can learn, and I will report it at Dreamland and Earth Files. And this uh, underscores that for a hundred years and more, that humans have been dealing with Earth mysteries that involve similar kinds of suspended light, suspended appearances in the sky, encountering on the ground in the mythologies that we have called fairies and gnomes that may not have been, but may be the modern-day version of what Lieutenant Colonel Philip J. Corso calls extraterrestrial biological entities. And the question we don't have an answer to is who exactly is it? How many different groups are there? And why are they interacting with the surface life of this planet? Well, those are questions, Linda, that I suspect are going to be answered sooner rather than later because this moves very slowly. But it does move, folks, if you notice, if you think about the sort of mutilation reports we were talking about two or three years ago, very different picture here, very different picture. And I just want to mention briefly in passing about the Fatima story, when I was Young man, I knew Father Peter Rinaldi, who was heavily involved in the Shroud of Turin, and he told me, this was long before I had the faintest interest in the awareness of UFOs, uh, at least consciously, that uh, he had a friend who had been at Fatima during the time when the sun moved in the sky, and he said they could see a glowing disc with a ladder, and there were creatures moving up and down the ladder. And he he made it sound like a UFO thing rather than what we exactly like this these people were saying. And so I th- think that's corroboration anyway. And yeah, it look, go ahead. We have about fits, 20 seconds left. Okay. It fits in a lot uh, with the fact that they have done their book based on the real church documents that have been hidden for so long that have these details. And I'm just curious, what is your gut reaction to the second now horse in the sky, that photo. Well, the photo on earthfiles.com of the horse in the sky, this new one, is really very weird, folks. Uh, and I have to tell you, it's if this is happening, cattle, horses, cats, when is it going to start to be us? Out first, having gone to hell. Our guest today has considered this question, but not from a philosophical viewpoint, instead from an archaeological one. He has gone to hell and back and has returned like the great heroes of the past with a high and wonderful story to tell. Robert Temple is the author of 10 books, which have been translated into 43 languages. He is best known for his classic and still controversial book, The Serious Mystery, which presents the idea that the Dagon people of Mali preserved the tradition of extraterrestrial contact with intelligent beings from the Sirius star system. Other books by Mr. Temple include The Genius of China and The Crystal Sun. He is visiting professor of the history and philosophy of science at Tsinghua University in Beijing, fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, member of the Egypt Exploration Society, Royal Historical Society, Institute of Classical Studies, and the Society for the Promotion of Hellenistic Studies and Visiting Research Fellow of the University of the Aegean in Greece. His latest book, Oracles of the Dead, examines ancient methods of foretelling the future 
in discovering the physical location of the Greek underworld and explores the mysteries associated with Delphi and other oracles of the ancient world. Are there places where initiates came to be introduced to the secrets of the world of the gods? Do these places contain portals or doorways to the unknown country? Classical writers certainly thought so. Let's see what Robert Temple has dug up about what some consider to be the most incredible place on the earth. Welcome to Dreamland, Robert. Well, hello, William. It's nice to be talking to you. And I think I came all the way back from hell just for this experience. (laughs) Well, we certainly (laughs) appreciate your time to be with us. If it's okay with you, uh, since most of our listeners are probably a little more familiar with your work on the serious mystery, I'd like to begin by catching up our audience on what has been going on perhaps these past 30 years since you published the serious mysteries in 1976. It, it just, well, I've, had just enough time, I've had just enough time to get the theories and back. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, it, it seems like the, the mid-70s when you published The Serious Mystery, which I, you probably find it hard to believe it's been all those 30 years since then, but that time was when, of course, Sitchin published The Twelfth Planet, Eric Von Donneken's Chariots of the Gods was in the rage at that time. And, in fact, I just read today that Von Donneken has a six-hour series on the Chariots of the Gods set to broadcast on uh, the Sci-Fi channel. There seems as if, with the publication of your book, that you introduced a very powerful idea and powerful energy that still resonates. How do you feel about that line of research all these years later? Well, I'm glad it led to something, after all. And his interest in this subject of extraterrestrial contact, you've got, you talk about turning on the television these days, that's all you see, it seems, and in the popular cultures, TV shows such as Stargate, of course, now they're even talking about re- reviving Star Trek. Uh, off the top of your head, to kind of put you on the spot here just a moment, Robert, if you were writing, say, a, a fictional series that really told the story of the Dagon and their interaction with these intelligent beings from Sirius, what would that show be like? How would you envision perhaps a first episode unfolding? How did this contact initiate, and what was it all about? The, the Dogon never claimed that they had contact with visitors from outer space. It's a mistake when people think that I wrote a book about spacemen visiting Africa, because that's not what the serious mystery is about at all. The Dogon preserve information, which they claim came from a, a much earlier extraterrestrial contact, which they admit to have taken place in a different location, certainly not in Mali, where the Dogon now live. And the search involved finding out where did this really happen and and who were the people who were around at the time and when was it. But I never suggested anything about uh, extraterrestrial visits to Mali. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying that. That that helps a lot because I think that is a, a, a big misconception or a, certainly a popular one um, for those that haven't delved as, as deeply in the book as perhaps they should. Uh, let's well, not... I, I, I would like very much to do something about getting the story across in, in a way such as you suggested, but it would have to be done right. And um, that means that you have to know what was really going on. And since... The Serious Mystery came out in 1976 originally. I did a revised version of that book from in, that was published in 1998, which contained 50% more material. That's the one that's in print now, mm-hmm. which wholly supersedes the earlier edition, obviously. But even that is, is only a, a partial addition to the story, because as you pointed out, it's 30 years ago that the book came out, and that's 30 years of thinking time that I've had and further research. So the story's much bigger than anybody realizes, and I'd have to write an awful lot more than just a revised edition of the serious mystery to really get it across. But it is yeah, it maybe the biggest of stories. That is a a refrain that we often hear from authors in this genre, especially those, well, for example, I had a conversation with Christopher Dunn, who wrote a book. It took me a long time to work all that out and write it up, and so uh, the fact that uh, some people read it and 
thought about it seriously was rewarding. One doesn't want to just write a book and throw it in the hole. Mm -hmm. Have your views changed on this, this subject in the intervening years? No, they haven't changed. Uh, they've grown. Mm -hmm. it, and speaking of growth, you know, there's some interesting new information that's coming out from an author named Laird Scranton, whose book will be published by Inner Traditions here soon. And taking uh, a leap from some of the original research that you've done, he believes that the Dagon system of tribal myths bears a striking resemblance to the actual scientific structure of matter, starting with the atom and continuing all the way down to vibrating threads of uh, string theory. Have you kept up with that line of research, or have you continued in that regard, looking at the Dagon words and symbols and rituals that were used to describe perhaps the structure of matter and how they correspond with those found in ancient Egypt? Well, um, there's an enormous amount of further information about the Dogon tribe that I couldn't squeeze into the serious mystery, and um, their highly detailed uh, and numerically precise astrophysical knowledge is something that I reported, but I didn't go into all the other things. But they certainly did have uh, very advanced knowledge in other areas as well as that. And, and I think that people ought to be made aware that they have a, a writing system of over 30,000 written signs. 30,000 uh, written signs? Yes. They have an unbelievably advanced culture in, in many ways, although they don't have what we would consider technology. Um, and so... That, of course, was the basis of a serious mystery. How did they have detailed astrophysical knowledge, which could only be possessed if you had modern science with, without having modern science? And, and that's what led to the search as to where did the information come from and what was the answer to the mystery, which is still a mystery, but we think we know the answer. And so they, they had advanced information about other things. There are indications that they knew about uh, genetics and... Uh, uh, all sorts of things. I haven't seen the book from Inner Traditions that you mentioned now by somebody called Scranton, who must be uh, a Pennsylvanian. But I, uh, am, I, I do know Inner Traditions because they're my own publisher, and I highly recommend them. Mm -hmm. uh, Oracles of the Dead is the book. Inner Traditions is the publisher. Get your checkbook out. <laughs> That's great. You know, we are continually amazed by the, the intent. 10,000 years. You know, I I used to really ridicule the kind of people who said the end of the world is nigh, and the, the guys who used to stand on the street holding signs and, and saying uh, this was going to happen, and, and all the silly cults who said the end of the world will be in 1999 and, or 1966 or or yesterday or tomorrow or whatever. And, of course, they are all crazy. But I really do believe that this time it's for real that if we don't pull ourselves together, if we don't get to grips with the situation, which is fast approaching what they now call a tipping point, that's it. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. It's William Henry. We're continuing with Mr. Robert Temple. Robert, just before the break, we were talking about this idea of the tipping point, that now we're at the point of no return. This will, I think, enable us to segue into our conversation that we've invited you to discuss today, the foremost, and that is ancient techniques for predicting the future. We want to talk now about divination and prophecy. And to get into this, Robert, let me ask you this. What is it about divination and prophecy that fascinated you so much to put together this amazing 450-page work on this subject? Well, I, I've always been interested in the nature of time because I'm interested in the nature of reality, and reality has a certain temporal element to it. And, and in fact, um, I once published uh, my own theory of time, but it only appeared in German and never in English. The only person I ever knew who, who actually read it was Karl Popper, the philosopher, and he liked it, so that was my reward. But... I, I think that um, the, the particular interest in divination is, is it possible to know the future in advance? Because if so, it means our conventional notions of time are wrong. 
Now, the answer to that is simple for me because I've had prophetic dreams and um, prophetic hunches, which have been borne out. Therefore, I know subjectively that it's possible to know the future in advance. But uh, having the subjective certainty is one thing. Convincing anybody else is another. And so, because I have a particular interest in the ancient world and, and the origins of civilization, I've always been attracted to ancient Greece and Egypt and so forth. I decided to do a comprehensive survey of the techniques used to try to foretell the future throughout the ancient world. But because I'm not ethnocentric, and because I've spent 20 years intimately connected with... So called the Giza Power Plant recently, and he he's writing a new book right now, and he's confronted with that same issue that really the story is so much larger than a person can, can really wrap their imagination around, and it, it's, it's almost an impossible task to try and get it onto the printed page to communicate the story. What do you suppose uh, we may be missing? What, what background knowledge do we, knew, do we need to bring into the fold here that's going to be able to help us to grasp this immense story? Well, one of the problems, William, is that uh, everybody's getting stupider every day. Education has basically collapsed. And so we used to have um, a general reading public with uh, an ability to understand things that, that was higher than it is today. And um, a lot of younger people have very short attention spans, and they, they can't really take anything in if it's more than five minutes long or more than five pages long, and we have a dilemma that as the urgency to understand the purpose and nature of, of life on this planet gets greater, our ability to comprehend it gets less. This is due to a very serious decline in the level of our Western civilization. It's, it's in an advanced stage of decadence, which is accelerating. In fact, it's becoming exponential and at the very moment when we need to have our wits about us, we're losing our wits. Is this a cyclical losing of our wits? In other words, do you feel like previous cultures had this understanding? There was this point of illumination, and then the darkness inevitably came, and now we're either going coming into a, a place where we're going to go deeper into the darkness or we're going to emerge into the light. So is, is this a cyclical thing? Is it possible for us to grasp this, or do you think that basically uh, that, that we're pretty doomed at this moment? Well, I don't think we have a second chance now. Um, of course, there, there is a cyclical aspect to the rises and, and, and the falls of successive civilizations, and there are many factors in common uh, about the way different civilizations decline and collapse and are then finally replaced by somebody else. But that was then, and this is now, and what's happening now is different because we now have major damage to the Earth's environment and the climate change is so severe that um, we are basically accelerating toward the final showdown of are we going to make it or are we not going to make it? I don't think that there's another one after this. This is this is the one, the one that everybody's been waiting for for 